Let's look back at this, the sad chapter, one of the saddest chapters in the history of the world, the genocide itself. And how did it start? Well, you know what? You know that the tension was started and it really escalated uh, in 1994 when the plane of the president of Rwanda, who was a Hutu, was shot down at Kigali Airport. And therefore, uh, the Hutus then attacked the minority Tutsis. It led to hundreds of uh, these uh, Tutsis being killed. And therefore, it led to what was described as the darkest moment on the continent. Uh, because you know that uh, that tension also spilled into other neighboring countries, such as uh, Burundi and also the DRC. Perhaps one should look at what South Africa was doing at that moment, because even today, People are still accusing the con international community mm. for failure to see the signs, but also to intervene during the build-up of this conflict. South Africa at that moment, it was in 1994, uh, the country was preparing for elections. And therefore, we are told, in fact, this was said by the former president of South Africa, Thabo Mbeki, that uh, the group in Rwanda did get in touch with the ANC then to make them aware that the then apartheid government was supplying arms in that country and that may lead to a genocide. But because South Africa was busy with the preparations to elections, no attention was kind of paid into this matter by both the then government, which was illegitimate, and no one would have listened to them, but also by the African National Congress and other related uh, fraternal parties yeah. in terms of assisting to ensure that this doesn't happen. But then between the 7th of April to the 15th of July, this massacre happened. So if you talk to us about the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda and people who were convicted. Uh, what about those who faced trial in community courts in Rwanda? Did, did it bring some sort of, of closure for the country in general? It go, it, I can say it, it, it goes without saying that uh, the establishment of such courts did help. Mm. But you still have people who are out of Rwanda, who are in neighboring countries or abroad international community, like Europe in particular in America, where the people who were perpetrators and supporters of this massacre uh, fled to, you know, they fled to countries such as uh, Belgium, France. And even today, at times, you still find a situation where those countries, particularly in Europe, yeah. is arresting those people who are involved in this uh, uh, disasters, a, a blight, a, a black spot on the continent, the Rwandan genocide. Mm. And they are being uh, tried in different courts are outside Rwanda. Some are being brought back to Rwanda, but that process is still continuing. But the question yep. is, now people are asking questions that is this not now being used to hunt and to, to, to fight with defending voices in, in, in Rwanda? And it has become another dimension in terms of uh, people accusing the current president, President Paul Kagame, that he is not actually addressing the problems of the past, but it is just a, a, a way to fight uh, his own battle. And therefore, now the international community must look at how this process is not being used to, uh, you know, clamp down on dissent mm. and also on human rights. The alleged genocide financier, Felicien Kabuka, was arrested in France last year. Uh, what's the latest, uh, Sophie, with regards to that case? Well, he's still there. He's still in France. Uh, 
there was hope that she will be sent back to Rwanda to face trial. There are arguments that he's too old. And that process is still continuing. That is why I'm talking about as you get these people, ensure that the process is done and is done in a way that uh, it's not a way of uh, punishing other people who who hold a different view from the current view of the sitting president. And therefore, this process will continue. He is still there. There's hope that uh, the matter will be attended to this year. Mm. You know, the issue of uh, COVID-19 last year, uh, not much attention was paid into such issues, but all around the world, people were focusing on issues that are related to COVID-19. But uh, we know that uh, when I was in Rwanda in 2019, uh, the, the women uh, were gathering in Rwanda under the auspice of the African Union looking at development on the continent. Yeah. Uh, the women in Rwanda were telling us that those courts did assist because they were also involved. And this is what led to women in Rwanda being able to participate in decision-making yeah. levels, different levels, be it in the judiciary, the legislature, but also in cabinet. And therefore, I think uh, that healing process will continue and must continue. Yeah. We, we often hear uh, of policies encouraging rapid growth and technological advancement. Rwanda uh, also was one of the highest ranked countries in the world in terms of the most women uh, in parliament. Uh, what would you say, Sophie, or uh, Africa? What lessons can Africa and the rest of the world learn from Rwanda? Well, there's a lot that uh, we uh outside Rwanda can learn, uh, the, the neighboring countries and African countries, but the world in general in terms of empowerment of women, but also in terms of how a country can uh, work very hard to ensure that uh, it does prosper. Even though perhaps in the countryside there are still challenges, because as you do that, when you develop develop a country, you will still have challenges on, you know, in the countryside. Yeah. I think it is a good example. Uh, we know that uh, it doesn't have much mineral resources underground, mm. but it is agriculture, tourism, uh, that has led to the development we see in Rwanda, but also they chose a knowledge economy and uh, science and technology, innovation, is what they are focusing on currently. And the young people in Rwanda, because because the, the genocide also, many people were killed. And yeah. when you look at the population in Rwanda, mainly women and young people, therefore the young people in that country are working very hard to turn the situation around. And the focus has been on the knowledge economy yeah. and you know science and technology in particular and stem subjects to ensure that uh, when they leave from primary school to high school and finally to higher education where they get uh, their skills they are able mm. to advance their skills on the particularly the, no the, the knowledge economy and yeah. also uh, focusing on, 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 on technology, exchange programs with countries that have uh, made progress, made progress in terms of uh, technological advancement. That's a very important point, Sophie, which I want to just double down on with regards to the youth uh, working tirelessly in that country in order to rebuild the country uh, with regards to the regeneration uh, in Rwanda, the, the renewal and the restoration, you would say that, that the genocide still casts a long shadow? It does, it does, because you cannot remove the scars overnight. Mm. It will take time for the nation to heal because there are people who didn't find closure during that process of those courts, and therefore they still want answers. But the good thing is that the youth in that country are working hard to develop their own country. And perhaps uh, the leaders in that country 
can use that energy and that uh, interest from young people to develop their country further, but also to go back to ensuring that there is closure and also to ensure that all, 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 all families that were affected, they are able to move forward. Mm. What about Rwanda's current role in the region, Sophie, as well as the, the continent at large? Rwanda is currently the chair, I think, of one of the strategic uh, positions on the continent, not as the AU chair, but one of the committees. Uh, and it is continuing to assist in the restructuring of the African Union. You know that uh, the African Union uh, reforms were led by President Paul Kagame, and therefore implementation is continuing. In the region itself, that is East Africa, Rwanda is trying to reach out to its neighbor in terms of uh, ensuring that there's uh, 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 the political relationship is sound, but also the economic uh, uh, relationship is also sound. And therefore, trade and investment in that East Africa community flourish. And therefore, you always see uh, President Kagame trying even to reach out to the DRC yeah. and to Kenya and to Uganda, even though at times between Rwanda and Uganda, you have these challenges because the Great Lakes region, uh, it is relatively peaceful right now, yeah. but there's always those simmering tensions. But uh, the president of Rwanda is playing a prominent role in the region, on the continent, and globally. He gets to be invited yeah. to these multilateral fora where he's able to talk about the position of Africa and the reforms. Uh, within the AU, but also generally the continent, but also his country. He has reached out to many countries. You see, even on, in, in sports, yeah. he has tried to uh, uh, develop sports in that country. But also women in particular are at the center of all the developments in that country. There's very, various elements to the story, uh, Sophie, and we thank you very much indeed for bringing clarity and a perspective on these matters as well as context. Uh, be well. Sophie Mokwena, the our foreign editor, SABC foreign editor. No doubt we will keep a close eye on the story uh, this week as that country and the rest of the world, in fact, commemorates the 27th uh, anniversary of the genocide in that country.